Okay, I think we've got a nice steady number here. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, hi, everybody. Well, in a moment. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Frank Marsick, and uh, I'm a research scientist in um, the Climate and Space Sciences and Engineering Department here at the University of Michigan. And um, what I want to do is share with you um, just a few slides here at the beginning, and then we'll go ahead and uh, uh, transition off to our speakers. Uh, the name of our, our, our webinar, our discussion really, um, we're hoping it to be today is called Supporting Neurodiverse Students in Your Summer Inter or in Your Internship Programs. Um, we have a group of people really that are, are joining us today. Um, I'm the one in the middle there. Uh, I'm the site director for the Picasso RU program here uh, at the University of Michigan. Um, as well as teaching a series of courses in meteorology and, and some first year student courses as well. The picture that you see in the middle um, is a selfie that I took with some students because thanks to a nod from um, one of my colleagues, um, I have started hosting uh, many of my office hours in the dining halls here at U of M uh, because it really shifts the dynamic. Uh, instead of the students feeling awkward coming into my office, uh, I have dinner with them and it, it really um, it works out very nicely. So um, Val, I'll just have everyone introduce themselves, um, Val and, and Shiva, and then we'll our, our other guests. So Val, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Val Sloan. I work at um, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, my background is in Arctic and Alpine glacial geology, and uh, but now I work in um, higher ed and diversity topics um, and support the GORAU community of people who run internships, um, as well as uh, supporting postdocs and early career people here at NCAR. Shiva? Hi, uh, my name is Shiva Priya Santanam. I go by Shiva. I am an assistant professor at the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders. I'm a speech and language therapist um, by training. That's my clinical background. Um, and I work at Bowling Green State University. It is in the state of Ohio in, in USA. Um, and I'm going to be sharing um, some of the experiences from my work and um, what I have learned from both my research and my teaching um, with autistic um, college students. And so I hope um, the content of this presentation is helpful for, for, for you all. Excellent. And we have two other guests with us. Akila, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Akila Alwan. I am a PhD candidate at Auburn University in Earth System Science. I will also be uh, getting my master's in educational research measurement and evaluation this Friday. Um, and I am a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow and UCAR Next Generation DEI Fellow and Southern Regional Education Board Doctoral Fellow. Outstanding. And Cole. Uh, good afternoon, every good whatever morning, afternoon, evening, would insert the time of day where you are uh, in that sentence. Um, my name is Cole Kingsbury, and I am a research geologist at Tomsk State University. It's in Siberia. Um, and I study um, ancient volcanoes uh, around the world, um, either uh, used to be in Canada uh, now, and then in South Africa, and now I'm doing work on the NSA Ridge in um, north of Krasnoyarsk. Outstanding. So thank you, both of you. Um, so before I hand it off, we just wanted to talk a little bit about the motivation of what, what has brought us all here today. Um, we know that you know, NSF and, and, and many different um, organizations um, are, are calling for us to, to broaden the, the, the possibilities or the, the opportunities and expand uh, participation opportunities for groups, um, diverse groups from you know, various institutions, geographical regions, and, and uh, that are underrepresented in, in STEM fields. And um, while that's all good and well and good to say that on paper, what that means is we need to have the tools and the training necessary to support those students from this, this diverse um, pool that, that we're developing for our programs. And um, so uh, last year, um, I welcomed in two students that I uh, self-identified uh, as being on the autism spectrum. 
And we thought we had put in all the, the, um, the supports that, that we, we needed to, to make sure that this was a positive experience for the students. And, and I think it largely was, but then at the end, um, one of our students had trouble taking all that they had done and synthesizing it um, into a final poster. And in fact, it was a very difficult time for the student. And, and I realized at that point that, that there was so much more that I needed to learn in order to support you know, this wide breadth of, of neurodiversity that we see in our students. And so I reached out to Val and I said, help. Um, and uh, as most of you know, when you, when you uh, reach out like that, oftentimes you, you get involved in, in volunteering, if you will, um, to make some of those things happen as well. And so we, uh, earlier in the spring, um, we had a, um, we had a, a small workshop in, in, in Akila and Cole were part of that. Uh, in which we kind of talked about uh, some of the different site leaders, about what were some of the tools that we hoped that, that we could acquire to help us support our students. And this workshop that we're going to have today uh, is actually um, one of the results of that initial, and that initial workshop. And so um, one of, uh, you know, we, we have presenters, but you know, one of my colleagues, Anita Bone at, at the Office of Student Life here at U of M, um, has noted that uh, the wisdom is in the room meaning we have some experts, we have uh, uh, folks who wanna share their stories, but there are lots of stories and experiences that we all have. And we're looking forward to, to hearing everyone, uh, you know, entering information into the chat or, or, or sharing in person. Um, uh, the session goals overall that we're, we're looking for is a, you know, a brief description of neurodiversity and unique strengths of, uh, and challenges of neurodiverse students. Um, and, but one of the things that, that came out of that initial meeting is folks really wanting some tangible things that they could use to support their students. So obviously, there are a, a range of different um, uh, situations uh, that we think of, uh, challenges we think of that, that follow, fall under the neurodiverse, um, uh, you know, heading, if you will, a, a unique one that's you know, not on this list, but that I ran into a couple of years ago was I was actually having our students, you know, talking about careers. And I was having them do a, a visioning exercise. And afterward, this one of my uh, participants came up and said, well, they, you know, appreciated that, that uh, you know, what we we're trying to do with the visioning, but they said they, they had aphantasia, they said, which was that, you know, they could not actually, actually picture things in the future in their mind. So they had trouble, you know, when reading things, especially like flowery things about oh, the scent of something, you know, of an orange in the room is set on the table. And they had trouble actually picturing that in their mind. And so they had to use different approaches to planning and things like that. So there's all kinds of, of things that, that we need to be cognizant of, um, you know, as, as, as site leaders. Um, and so uh, Shiva is going to provide us with, uh, you know, talking about some of those supports and methods to assess whether or not we've, we've been successful. So I'm gonna turn it over to Shiva um, to go ahead and uh, start her presentation. She has provided us with a few different resources. And now that now that we seem to have uh, most of our, our participants here with us, um, as she begins her presentation, I'm going to be sharing those resources in the chat feature. So you should be seeing those show up uh, in just a couple of moments. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I will turn it over to our uh, speakers. All right, um, wonderful. Thank you so much um, for that introduction, um, Frank. It, it helps understand um, where you're all coming from. And um, I also wanted to say um, a big thank you. Uh, usually people put their thank you slide at the very end. I kind of put it at the very beginning because I wanted to say big thank you for taking this initiative. Um, uh, it is important for me and it's important for a lot of um, neurodiverse students that I support. Um, I primarily work with autistic individuals. Um, and so um, I'm a very fierce advocate of um, autistic people and their value in higher education and other um, settings. So, so thank you so much for, for having us um, be part of this. Um, some disclosures that um, I have to share every time I present, I'm required to share these. Um, I'm a full-time employee at Bowling Green State University um, in, the, in the United States. Um, I'm also the developer of a support program for college students on the autism spectrum. I'm a licensed speech and language therapist um, in, the, in the US. 
um, and I receive financial compensation for presenting today. Um, and like I said, a very big thank you to you all. And here are my learning outcomes, which Frank has already discussed or mentioned. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and jump into the content today. Um, so these terms, several of you might be familiar with, but to bring everyone to the same page, um, I wanted to um, put these on a slide so everybody can both hear and, and um, read about these. So neurodiversity basically means a variation in neurocognitive function. Now, what does that mean in like layman terms is um, if someone can understand information differently from what we are typically used to, someone who processes and, per and perceives information differently um, from uh, from what, like I said, what, what we expect as the socially acceptable range, um, then you know, that is what we mean by neurodiversity. Neurodivergent is the term used to refer to one individual person and neurodiverse is used to refer to a group. Um, and so the neurotypical, word, the word neurotypical is used to describe individuals who we traditionally have been describing them as normal or typical. Um, and that, you, that refers to individuals within the socially acceptable range. Now, the most important thing to understand here is that neurodiverse people are a minority in the entire human population. Um, but the term neurodiversity itself comprises the entire human race, which means each of us is very different from the other. Um, in how our brain processes information, in how our brain understands, how we communicate, how we interact socially, how we learn and everything else. So the neurodiversity movement, it started out as a political movement initially. Um, and um, I'm gonna move you all to another screen so I can have my slides here. Um, there we go. Um, it started out as a social political movement. And there is a common myth about the neurodiversity movement that it only perpetuates or propagates strengths um, and not challenges and that we ignore the challenges that neurodiverse individuals experience in their daily lives. Um, and that is a very common myth. And it is, again, you know, as we say, it is a myth, therefore not a fact. Um, the neurodiversity movement endorses accommodations, which means we um, identify, recognize, and offer the support that neurodiverse individuals um, need to be, um, you know, successful, efficient, um, and, and have a fulfilling life. Um, we do not deny any services, um, and it is not about speaking only of the strengths, but also acknowledging that neurodiverse individuals have um, challenges in their daily lives. Um, so the neurodiversity movement as such asks for um, increased inclusion and respect for all individuals, irrespective um, of their age and type of disability. So um, I personally do not identify as a neurodivergent person. I um, am not autistic. Um, I use the term um, autistic when I describe the individuals, my students or my clients that I support. I also use the term person on the autism spectrum. I also often like to ask people what their preference is. Um, I, get, I should say I always ask people what their preference is um, when I talk to them. And I encourage other people to do that as well. Um, several of my students do not have a preference. They are okay with either one um, and they don't really mind. And parents of several of my students also do not have a preference sometimes, but some people actually do have a preference. So it's okay to ask people. Um, I wanted to introduce these two models here. One is, and I'll tell you why this is important for our discussion today. One is called the medical model of disability. According to this model, any disabled person experiences challenges, which we call impairments, right? 
So when we describe these impairments, they are often described as challenges that are intrinsic or challenges that are inherent that, that live within the person. So what we try to do when we approach a disabled person through the lens of the medical model is that we try to um, reduce the challenges, remove the challenges, or make the disabled person um, different from who they are not. So we try to modify in a lot of ways their, their true identity. We modify um, how their challenges or disability presents itself. Um, and we believe that the challenges that a disabled person experiences in their daily life is because they have that condition. Um, and you can replace the word condition with any um, term that, that falls within the neurodiversity umbrella um, which includes autism and attention deficit hyperactivity, um, fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, mental health, um, you know, challenges, uh, dyslexia, all of those um, fall under the neurodiversity umbrella. So um, in contrast to the medical model is the social model. And this is what I prefer using in my work. Um, and it informs a lot of my current research, my teaching, and my clinical practice um, is the social model believes that a person is disabled not because um, they have intrinsic challenges, but because there are barriers that are set up within the environment or the society um, that do not allow the disabled person to actually complete activities of their daily life. So the social environment is the one that actually makes them disabled. Um, and um, in a lot of clinical practice, sometimes we tend to use a combination of both um, because it is required, um, especially in countries such as the United States where healthcare is highly dependent on um, you know, health, private health insurance systems or federal health insurance systems, um, we have to go by the medical model a lot of times, even if we don't have a preference. So for example, diagnosing a person, providing them a clinical diagnosis, um, writing reports that primarily talk only about the challenges that the person experiences, um, all of these fall within the medical model because we need that. We need to show proof or evidence to the health insurance um, companies that this person needs services. So in order to do that, we have to follow some protocol. Um, whereas in other countries, you might have a little bit more of a, you know, open uh, mechanism where you might actually not need a diagnosis and you might still be able to receive all the supports that you need, um, either through private pay or through federally um, supported, like the government supported um, health insurance or services. So um, today, with that brief introduction, I want to jump into the main crux of what we're doing today is to share strategies and what you can take home with you to when you support um, autistic students, undergraduates within your internship programs. Um, so I'd start with this uh, very broad slide, um, and I'm encouraging you to pay attention to the different communication strengths um, and differences that um, your students uh, demonstrate. The second thing I'm encouraging you to pay attention is to their sensory preferences and differences. So the cat first category is communication. The second category is sensory. And the third category is how they learn. Um, so these are three areas that I'm encouraging you to start uh, paying attention to as you're supporting or working with um, your uh, internship students. So I'll pause there for a second. Um, here's an activity for everyone. Please feel, to, feel free to contribute via Zoom or you can unmute yourself and speak through the microphone. What do you value about um, any neurodivergent student that you have had? Or if you are neurodivergent yourself, what do you think add, adds value? What, how, how is, what is your value um, in the work or training that you are engaged in? Thanks, um, Frank, yes. Honesty and directness.
Uh huh. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. I love that. Wonderful. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, those are absolutely, absolutely what I'm going to be talking about as well. Um, thank you so much. Yes. Um, yes. So uh, communication strengths and differences. And as Frank started out this um, response here, honesty is the first thing that I'm going to mention here as well. Um, the prime when I'm primarily talking about autistic students that that I have supported or engaged with um, an, autistic students and other neurodivergent diverse students um, have a high tendency to be honest. Now um, this can come across as direct and abrupt sometimes, but um, their communication is always honest. I've never seen or never had an experience with any of my autistic students. Um, ever lie to me or, uh, you know, try to deceive me or say things that are, you know, uh, manipulative. So uh, it's, it's actually one of the most valuable qualities that I have seen um, in my students. Um, they are multimodal, whether it's communication or engagement with activities. Um, they're always trying to use whatever modality they can um, in order to convey the information or communicate with, with other individuals. They are highly empathetic individuals, contrary to popular belief that a lot of you know, discussions exist in um, either within research or even within uh, media, like TV shows and movies, that autistic people lack empathy, which is just absolute you know, a false statement because um, there is a high level of empathy that that autistic people um, have both for um, you know, emotional empathy where they can understand another person's empathy um, and, and social empathy. They understand a, a group you know, of people's uh, emotions and, and what they experience as well. These are both very important and um, for a person to be having a fulfilling life. And because uh, what we're used to is seeing empathy expressed in a certain way, and when we don't see that expressed in, in the autistic population, we think that autistic people lack empathy. Um, and that's absolutely not true. Um, lots of autistic students are highly detail-oriented. They provide specific details, whether that's written communication or spoken communication. Um, they tend to be very direct um, and that's that's helpful, especially if you are um, writing about a, a research topic that, that you have explored or um, a, an experiment that you have conducted. It's important to be specific. It's important to be detail-oriented and direct. And all of those are great strengths um, that autistic um, individuals have. Um, the, in terms of differences, um, Autistic individuals tend to not maintain eye contact in the way that we're typically used to um, eye contact. Um, there are differences in the sense that some autistic people might um, look at you a lot um, and you or might also um, almost feel like they're peering into the, your eyes. Um, and some autistic people do not look at you while they're speaking um, and that's completely normal for them. Um, for someone who's not autistic, this might look very different because um, they're not used to seeing someone um, who does not maintain eye contact. The second thing is um, the use of non-literal language or figurative language. Now, again, um, some autistic individuals have challenges with understanding figurative language when we use expressions like, uh, you know, walking on eggshells or, you know, things like that. When, when you're using expressions like that, it, it's hard for some autistic individuals, not all autistic individuals, but some of them, it's hard for them to understand. Um, and it's hard, sometimes they don't use it as well. Several of my students tell me that they rehearse these um, expressions and they use them. Um, I find it quite common to people who speak English as their second language, um, you know, or people who learn other languages. When we learn a new language, we actually don't learn, um, you know, the the expressions and the idioms and, you know, things like that. So, 
So there, you're, you don't lose much by not knowing those expressions. So I always encourage professors or you know mentors to be more explicit when they're communicating with their neurodiverse students and try to avoid any flowery figurative language if they can. Um, facial expressions, again, this is something we're used to seeing facial expressions a certain way when we look at non-autistic people. So when we look at autistic people or other neurodiverse individuals, we expect a certain type of facial expressions, whether it's anger or sadness. But one should remember that the way facial expressions are processed in the brain and how we all process an emotion in the brain is very different. And so facial expressions may not always look the same. Um, in a class, when you're teaching, you might all, all, almost have a flat affect for someone, but that person might be very highly engaged. You just don't think that is engagement because you think of engagement a in a certain way. So um, when that person does not engage in the way that you expect them to engage, you think that person's not engaging. So, um, and that's why I'm going to share some tools here that, that help you actually understand if, if, the, if the autistic person or the neurodiverse student is actually engaging. Um, processing time. Now, this is very, very important. Every time I speak to professors, I speak to any kind of supervisors, I tell them, um, you know, how to pay attention to the processing time. When we give a direction, whether it's written direction or in an email or a piece of paper or a spoken direction, we always almost e expect a quick response, like within a few seconds. Um, people process information differently. Some people might need a minute. Um, in a lecture, for example, when you ask a question, some people might need 15 seconds to respond. Some people might need a minute to respond. So you have to allow people that time. I typically, what I do in my emails when I write to neurodiverse students or you know, autistic students primarily, is I say, I would like to um, you know, have some solution or feedback to you by this date, or um, please respond to my email within this, within 5 p.m. on Friday or something like that. So I give them enough time to, to actually read the email um, and think about it and respond. So that processing time is very, very important. And remember that we're all bombarded with information from multiple sources in our lives. It's social media, it's the news channels, it is you know what you're reading, what you're studying, it's, it's everything. So, um, so we need to allow that, that additional response time for people to, uh, when you're communicating. Um, and so that tends to be a difference in, in autistic people as well. Social cues, both comprehension and use of social cues. Um, the way that autistic individuals pick up on social cues, again, looks very different from the way that we're typically used to. Um, and some autistic individuals who want to learn how non-autistic people engage socially actually make the effort to learn how to interpret non-autistic social cues. I think it's important for non-autistic people um, who are the majority to learn how neurodiverse or autistic people um, engage in social cues as well. It should be a two-way street. It should be, it shouldn't be like the whole burden falls on the autistic person to learn how non-autistic people communicate and engage, but it's all it should also fall on the burden should also be equally fall, falling on the non-autistic people to learn and engage about uh, neurodiversity and about autistic people. Now I want to make it very clear here that even though you might not have in, in, you know, interacted or come across many students who may, who may not be speaking or um, who may be using a communication device such as an electronic device or a sign language to communicate, this is something that you may want to take into consideration because I am seeing right now a lot of my co-researchers are semi-speaking individuals. My entire Zoom meeting happens in a way where I'm the only speaking person. Um, as in, you know, my primary modality is speech. Um, my collaborators um, are sitting in the same Zoom room and they are all typing or pressing a certain button and their devices are speaking back to me. So these are um, things that one has to get trained in, be willing and flexible to incorporate in your trainings as well, because the, um, the, the contribution of all these individuals is just phenomenal. And I, and I always beat myself up thinking, what was I doing all these years, not incorporating their, 
their voices or their experiences into my work? Like, why didn't I even tap into the, the ability of this population? So, so I want you to always keep thinking that not all students you have are going to be um, using speech as their primary modality. So they might be multimodal communicators. They might be using other, other modalities of communication as well. So um, when I talk about, um, I'll quickly jump through this slide, sensory differences or sensory preferences. Um, lots of neurodiverse individuals um, have preferences for certain types of um, sensory inputs. And, and some sensory input can be either, um, you know, provoking distress or anxiety for them. It can be a certain type of sound, uh, noise. It can be a light in the room. It can be just multiple people in the room. Um, it can be a smell. It can be texture, fabric. Um, I've had autistic students tell me that it is sometimes even um, just spending time on social media can be a, a huge, you know, overstimulation for their senses. So um, these are some things that that you may want to be aware of and how they spend their day, you know, how much time they're spending in these environments. Several of my autistic students are gamers. They spend about eight, nine hours a day video gaming on days that they don't have to go to school or university, um, you know, so they uh, in that space, their engagement with of their senses is very different from how their senses are engaged when they're in in-person um, interactions with other people. So these are things that you want to keep in mind and um, and identify how the sensory environment is constructed or how you're going to support this neurodiverse student by modifying um, the environment. So the way to do that really is to ask the student because there's just no way um, that you'll be able to know everybody's sensory preferences or differences, right? So the best way to do is to ask them, um, what has been most helpful to you? What should I cut off or remove from this from the room? If it is an online Zoom or like Microsoft Teams meeting or something, what do I need to do to make that virtual environment more sensory friendly for you? It's not always the physical environment. Um, and what can I do to make it easier on you? Um, that could be simple things like providing breaks within um, activities. Um, I often in my one hour classes provide at least two breaks. This can just be, um, you know, just getting up, stretching your hands um, or taking a sip of water and not doing anything, just putting your head down you know, stop taking notes, stop writing things, stop, you know, stop doing everything. Just take a two minute break and two minutes to transition back. So it feels like, oh my gosh, I'm losing five minutes of my precious one hour class. I already have so much content to cover and so many projects to complete. You know, um, it feels like that initially, but in the long run, it, it helps you and, and it helps the student. Um, so so those are things that I want to want you to keep in mind as well as your um, supporting students. The other thing to keep in mind is the, the uh, third area is the learning differences. Um, so we're, we need to start acknowledging that our neurodiverse students are um, extremely valuable co contributors. Um, they're out of the box thinkers. And like several of you said, they're creative, they're detail oriented. They have an, a, a, a wonderful ability to focus intensely, especially if the topics or the activities are of high interest to them, um, which is an amazing skill to have. We need that kind of um, interest and, and passion when we are engaged in any type of research. Um, and what else do we need, right? So, um, but in terms of challenges, one needs to keep in mind that when a person is neurodiverse, they do uh, bring to the table some challenges. Now, these challenges can be things like, um, you know, uh, having, you know, being, being disturbed or disrupted um, by the things that are going on in their environment. Challenges with planning information, knowing when to do what, when to finish, um, you know, writing the results, when, how do I plan when I have to run this experiment in the lab? How do I contact my mentor or supervisor? 
You know, these can be things like if I have a presentation or a conference that come that's that's coming up in October, what do I need to do now? So for a lot of students, um, I use a backward planning template where uh, we take the final uh, you know, goal in mind and then we start planning backwards. Like, what do I need to do on the day of the presentation? What do I need to do before, like a week before, a one week before, and what do I need to do now to get ready for that presentation? So um, these are things that you might want to keep in mind, whether that's memory, planning, organization, time management, all of these things are challenging for several neurodiverse students. They need a, a ton of support in these areas. Um, and so as much as sometimes it might be in the initial days, a lot of handholding, a lot of, um, you know, uh, back and forth interaction with the student trying to find out what can I do to manage your time better. Um, so you might feel like you're spending a little bit more time with this neurodiverse student than you are with um, your non-autistic student, for example. Um, and, and, and what it helps with is that the student is one successful, you get a great, um, you know, collaboration with the student and whatever you're developing your project or your paper, your outcome is going to be, um, is going to be phenomenal as well. So, um, I know we don't have a ton of time. We could do discussions on just like worksheets for, you know, how do we plan better? How do we manage our time better? What are some things that we need to consider here? So those are, um, you know, items to keep in mind when you're planning for the learning differences that neurodiverse students bring um, to the table as well. So um, I'll move to, uh, you know, some of the barriers. Um, what I described by challenges are not intrinsic challenges here, but these are challenges that are presented to the neurodiverse students by their environment. Um, these can be in the form of misunderstandings or misperceptions um, from other people, especially the non-disabled community. It can be, uh, you know, lack of clarity or on what is expected or what directions the students the student needs. Um, sometimes, you know, mentors and professors tend to like throw out some directions and then um, we, it's very hard for us to know, you know, whether this is clear enough, is, is this specific enough? Um, and so that can be sometimes very confusing for neurodiverse students. So actually spending time um, writing your directions very clearly is very important. One rule of thumb that I use when I'm writing directions for students, whether it's for a project in my lab or it's an assignment for a class that I'm teaching, um, one rule of thumb I follow is every sentence must have only one message. So even if I have to break it down into multiple short sentences, I do not imply things. I do not you know, sugarcoat things. Um, I'm very direct. Um, I'm also very explicit with my directions. And each sentence has one message only. I don't try to crowd with like in multiple conjunctions, compound sentences and stuff like that. So that's that's an important, uh, you know, um, uh, strategy to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing is um, is experience of stigma. This can come across as discrimination, bullying, um, you know, harassment and stereotyping of neurodiverse individuals. There is a whole um, book that one, my, some of my colleagues and I are writing about misconception, misconceptions and myths associated with neurodiversity. Um, and I can go on and on about that. It's, um, it's pervasive everywhere in every environment. Um, and so we often, when I have heard these things, I, you know, I've, I've been shocked initially. I've been like, really, in my university, autistic students are being bullied. They're being discriminated. Wow, like I didn't even know that. You know, that's been my initial reaction. But the reality is, this is happening in front of us, just around us all the time, and one cannot deny um, that it is happening. Um, the other, um, you know, attribute or, or aspect of, of these uh, challenges or barriers is the unreasonable expectations for social interaction. A lot of times group meetings, like, you know, when we have a meeting for my lab or some of my classes, we have like an honors thesis project and all of the honor students meet and everybody wants to meet at a bar. And that might not be the most friendly space for 
um, for several of our neurodiverse students. They might want to be outside maybe, you know, so finding out what might be the most, uh, you know, friendly space in terms of social interaction, that is very important to, to find, find out from the students. And if students don't show up for those social gatherings, it's all right, you know, they shouldn't be penalized for that. Nobody should, you know, we shouldn't hold it against them. Um, we shouldn't be like, oh, you didn't come to that party. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to talk to you. You know, it's it's a, we have to lose kind of lose all of that pettiness um, when we expect what we expect in our social interactions. Um, and I'm not saying you all do this, but these happen in daily life because students experience this. And remember, a lot of undergraduate students are in their early 20s. They are in their late teens. And so this is the time they're actually trying to figure out their identity. They want to be socially included. At the same time, they know that their social interaction settings are quite challenging and they feel like this is overwhelming for them. And so when there is that conflict of, I want to be in that social space, but I'm still finding it overwhelming, that can be very confusing for them. So um, we, we want, you know, it's important for us to be more sensitive to that um, when, we're, when we're expecting, you know, what we're expecting out of social interactions. Um, lack of un <coughs> understanding and appreciation, all of this that I said, often leads to social isolation, being alone, not having a space to, to engage and interact. Um, a, a primary area of my research um, focuses on reducing social, interact, social isolations by increasing or providing opportunities for, for social interaction between autistic students, whether they're high school students or um, college age students. And we use video gaming as a platform um, for interaction. So I tapped into their own um, intense or focused interests um, in order to build peer networks and peer supports for them um, to be uh, to reduce social isolation. The final point here that I want you to keep in mind is our societies are highly, highly influenced by ableist tendencies, which means we all in the core believe that um, non-disabled people are in some ways better than disabled people. Um, and we have to accept that as a fact. And therefore we thrust these beliefs on the disabled individuals in our community. Therefore, what happens is whether these come from parents or other members of the community, a lot of neurodiverse students internalize these negative evaluations. They experience low self-esteem. They start experiencing what is called an internalized ableism. Um, even though they resist ableism outwardly, um, in, in their minds, they feel like they are in some ways lesser than someone who does not have that diagnosed condition. Um, and this is very important to acknowledge because um, we deny this and we don't speak about it enough. Um, but our students need a lot of support. This is one of the main or core reasons that contributes to mental health challenges for several of our neurodiverse students. Now, this is a whole new topic that I could go on for three hours. Barriers are more for women um, or people who identify with the feminine gender. Um, we are expected to be more tactful, more social, we're judged more harshly. Um, I'm going to be sharing all these slides with you, so please take a few minutes to watch this very, you know, very well done video. Um, it takes you to a YouTube link, um, and it helps you learn more about the challenges of women. So common reasons for um, why mentors and supervisors or professors avoid or hesitate to provide supports for neurodiverse students is one, lack of knowledge, even if they want to, they don't know how to. The other is there might be some inherent negative perceptions. There's a lot more time and money and effort spent on this. Oh, I need more resources. My system or my organization does not provide me these resources. What incentive do I get to do these things? Why should I care? You know, does it impact my work? If I have only one student in my lab among 10 students, um, you know, and that only one student is neurodiverse, why should I spend that extra time? What incentive am I getting for that? So those are questions that I'm commonly asked, and these are things that I want you to reflect on as well. So strategies, how much time do we have? Do I have? Um, um, go ahead, Del. 
No, no, you go ahead. I was going to say um, we want to make sure that um, that our other speakers have an opportunity. So uh, another five minutes or so is that okay? okay. Sounds good. We can come back with questions to you know address some of these other slides. Sounds good. Sounds wonderful. Okay. So um, what I'm encouraging for you all to do is focus on these five elements, the structure, the clarity um, of the instructions and the supports that you're providing your um, neurodiverse students. Use more flexibility in your approaches, provide opportunities for practice as much as you can, and always, always use appreciation. When I say appreciation, it's not just praise, but also increased understanding. Um, here are some resources that I'm going to share the, in these slides. One is a research book, booklet that I developed. This addresses common questions about disclosure, um, you know, disruption in the classroom, and, you know, replace the classroom with your internship environment. Um, this was developed for a university setting for in the classroom kind of situation. Um, and I developed this in collaboration with um, one autistic professor um, and couple autistic students, along with another team of professors. So that resource is there available for you. Um, as much as you can advocate for pe neurodiverse people in your environments. I want to spend more time on this. So the remaining four or four or so minutes that I have, I'll spend time on this, but I'll share that you know you have all these resources available for you if you need to find an an expert or a consultant in your area there's a link for you to go click on the map and it'll take you to a statewide you know consultant um, to support you um, there's also like autism specific college programs so that again there is a map there for you um you know, and then the focused interest. I'll talk. To, I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So um, I'm gonna. If you want to click on the word document that Frank had shared, um, that has an initial uh, meeting questionnaire. It's somewhere in the chat. So um, if you want to click open that, that should take you to a um, a document. And in that document, you will see the following questions. Um, this is the document that I created. If, when you meet with your neurodiverse, neurodiverse student, neurodivergent student for the first time. So um, have this as a way to understand or um, get input from the student to learn more about them. Um, I also use this questionnaire to um, share with the student how I communicate and how I grade and what are my expectations in terms of evaluating the student's performance. So here I typically write a, a short paragraph about my communication style. And then I ask the student, what is your preferred communication method? Um, the way I envision this questionnaire to be completed, and I've and I've tried it with several of my students here, is we first, um, you know, meet either in person or virtually. We complete it individually, and then we share our responses and we talk through our responses. That is how I use this questionnaire. So um, it is not something that you fill out and then email it to the person and then you're done. So it doesn't work like that. You'll have to take these responses and talk through these responses with your student. Um, how often do you prefer to check in with me? This may be like many times a week, maybe two or three times a week, or maybe once every week, or you know, um, whatever your frequency is, you can adapt that. Um, you know, this is how I want to grade. So add your rubric here. This is how, and be very clear about what you what you're mentioning here. And then um, what areas of performance you want them to grow in? What, what are you expecting out of them? And what supports are you willing to provide to help them do well in these areas? Um, when students have questions, uh, oftentimes when I present this rubric, students are confused because they're like, I don't even know what my project is. So what is this rubric? And so um, I tell them that as your project comes up, you know, I'll, I'll present this rubric again and then we'll work through it. And we can see what aspects of it are confusing and let's support you with that. 
during the time that we work together, let us lay down expectations for each other. This is very, very important in my opinion, because um, what you have as your expectations for the entire lab or the whole group may be very different from what you have specific to this one neurodivergent student. And so um, lay down what those expectations are. Again, this comes out of a discussion as well. Um, and if there are misunderstandings, misconceptions, you know, um, I've had professors tell me, oh, that student was very rude. I don't even want to work with her. Um, so the chances are that student was not intending to be rude. And she just probably had a direct communication style. And the professor might have been like, oh, she didn't sugarcoat it. She just said it, you know, very bluntly. And so you might want to discuss this is why the communication style piece here is very important um, and discuss you know, what was confusing and you might need a mediator sometimes in these situations. So how, you know, when a confused, so laying that expectation right off the bat, like if I have a misunderstanding, what am I going to do? Um, are we going to speak about it? Are we going to email? Can we meet outside the lab, outside like, you know, like Frank just said in the beginning of this meeting, can we meet um, like in the dining hall, for example? Um, working in groups, now this is huge. One of the current projects that I'm doing right now is looking at communication experiences of autistic students and non-autistic students when they, when they engage in group assignments. Um, this is a huge problem for several neurodiverse students because our group expectations are very different. Um, and when we engage in groups, we don't know what are some unwritten hidden rules are for group interaction. Um, and so being very explicit about it, what is your preference? How big should a group be? What is a small group? Do we have a flexibility for meeting in like in a hybrid format? Like does everybody have to be in the same room? Um, you know, those kinds of things are important to talk about. And if you do have to meet as a group, um, having very clear, roles for each person in the group is is is, is super crucial. Um, so brainstorming how you want to support the student, what technology you use, what technology I use, and how can we both be on the same page? Um, and and in so I've categorized these as I don't know if you've noticed, but the first part is communication, the second part is learning, and the third part is sensory supports. Um, just those three areas that I described in the very beginning. So, um, you know, what do you do when you experience anxiety? <clears throat> some students might not have any coping strategies. So it's all right to sit down with them and brainstorm some coping strategies. Um, you know, what supports have been helpful for you to learn well in the past? You know, what can we use that? How can we use that? Um, and then what are your sensory needs or preferences? What can I do to reduce these um, challenges? So um, oftentimes, if you make the effort and show that you're willing to work with the student, that is huge because students rarely see this level of support from anyone. So when neurodiverse students come to me, they're like, wow, you've taken so much time to develop such detail, you know, so much support for me. Nobody's ever done this for me. And, and, and that's, you know, very valuable feedback for you. That's, that's um, reinforcement for you to want to do it more. Because it's it's the most magical thing when you see each of your if your mentees you know succeed in life right so um, this is you know what I'm describing in this um, in this slide here so finally I'll leave this um, I, I think I'm, I'm going to leave that slide for now I'm going to stop talking right there I think I've crossed the five minute probably gone beyond. So I'll stop talking there. Um, let Akila and um, Cole take over from here, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Yes, thank thank you very much, Shiva. and and I think the um, everyone should have that document. And I think that certainly some of the things that you mentioned are just the type of things yeah, on this document that many of our our uh, participants in that initial workshop were really wanting to do is everyone has the best intentions of wanting to be able to create the environment. I think that document, especially how you broke it down, um, is, is really going to be helpful to people. So um, as you mentioned, we, we have a couple of other special guests that they want to share their personal perspectives on things that they have found um, particularly beneficial and, and, and they hope that people understand and learn in, in this type of support. And so Akila, why don't we go ahead and and uh, start with you, uh, any, any types of sessions that you, uh, or suggestions you may have. 
Yeah, so um, for me, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned, um, I was recently um, diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I also have bipolar disorder. And a really big thing for me that I've had to learn, um, one is advocacy, self-advocacy, um, how to communicate um, to professors, PIs, amongst your peers, really in any situation in which, um, you know, you have needs that differ from other folks. Um, because, you know, as as you've uh, um, explained the difference between neurodivergent and neurotypical folks, you know, we, we place this ableist perspective on neurodivergent people to behave in the norms. Um, and so I think um, thinking about how you can, particularly um, for programs that um, prioritize mentorship, um, how you could incorporate discussions on self-advocacy um, in those mentorship trainings. So both how you can teach your mentors to support students in self-advocacy and how you can support students in seeking advocacy with amongst their mentors um, and the PIs of your program. Um, my second thought is on um, time management and organization. That is a huge struggle for me. Um, I've always been a procrastinator in high school. Um, I had amazing test grades and terrible homework grades because as, a, as an athlete in, a, in, a, in student government and orchestra, and I just had so many things, you know, hyper fixations, but so little time to do them. Um, and it's, and I, because of all my involvement, have learned better time management. It's not necessarily something that was taught. I think if I was taught it much sooner than I learned it, I would have been struggling far less longer. Um, so I think time management in the context of your program, um, because like for me, example, one program I did, actually most programs I've done that were, were where we were uh, working and each student was working in a different lab, we all had very, very, very different schedules. Um, me personally, I am, I, my, I had to take medications that night that make it hard to wake up in the morning. So I always, uh, one of the first conversations I have when discussing summer programs and labs is, what is your expectation for me to be here in the morning? What is your expectation of when I'm supposed to leave? How many hours should I work? Um, having flexibility in the range of opportunities that you have for your students in terms of that is great. Um, but also, you know, communicating with everyone involved that, you know, students, are come, they're all coming from you know all over and have very different schedules, live and work in very different time zones, um, and so you know how can we accommodate you know people's working schedules? I know even when I'm communicating with folks at UCAR, many folks have in their emails you know my working day may not be your working day, um, so you know, but we very we don't frequently have that expectation for students, and I don't think that's fair because. Um, you know, students in the same way, you know, some during the school year work from midnight to six o'clock in the morning, and those are their most productive hours. So I guess, so what I'm, in summary, what I'm saying is both teaching time management and organization, as well as respecting that everybody works on a different timeline and time frame than each other. Awesome. Thank you. And, and could you, could I ask you to expand a little bit? You mentioned, you know, the importance of the mentor um, providing an environment where the student feels comfortable advocating for themselves. Can you can you talk about what it is that that mentors can do to create that environment? Yeah. Um, so I think um, just from the very beginning, the introduction, getting to know, you know, who is who will be who the mentors are. Um, letting them, letting your students know that you're willing to accommodate them, but in order to accommodate them, you have to let, they have to let you know what their needs are, because we can assume only so far, and those assumptions may be wrong. Um, for example, like with my advisor, um, we have, it's been a learning process for her, um, but we discuss a lot. She, she, she's a, she's a morning person, and again, 
mornings are extremely difficult for me. Um, I, I'm so tired sometimes that I like, I'm, it's, it's almost like being intoxicated. I am not functional. And so I've, you know, been advocating for myself whenever she tries to schedule something early in the morning that I know I can't do it. And finally, one day, um, we did meet a little earlier than usual and I was at the library until midnight and she saw finally what I was talking about when I say I'm not functional if I don't get enough sleep and and her realization of oh this is what you've been talking about unfortunately it took her actually seeing it to get there um, mm -hmm. but um, she was willing to work for me because she was being flexible so I think what it comes down to is um, open dialogue and discussion and flexibility creates the environment for students to successfully advocate for themselves because they feel comfortable and they can trust you. Trust is really big um, for self-advocacy because if I know, if I have, to, you know, most of what I have to speak up for myself is uncomfortable. And if it's uncomfortable and I don't trust that you're actually gonna take me seriously or do anything about what I'm saying, what is the incentive for me to go to you in the first place? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, sharing that. Um, Cole, um, it's Wednesday morning. <laughs> and so uh, I know this is great for you to be, be up so late, but uh, what, what, what thoughts do you have you want to share? Yeah, so um, I've just been um, dropping notes um, as the things go along. Um, so um, the I want to piggyback with uh, uh, Akila on on the on the on the need to be flexible. Um, um, as I said in the in the chat, um, there are as many ways of being autistic as there are autistic students. Um, um, just like there's as many ways of being a volcano as there are volcanoes on earth each are a little bit different um, um, and so uh, assumptions that assumptions that um, are you know may be useful for one may be detrimental for the others so um, again uh, so uh, first of all uh, yeah so in regards to about you know the flexibility of work that touches on two key aspects um sensory needs as well as energy management um and I, i'd like to first talk a bit about energy management um and so there are two predominant ways of thinking about uh work there's project management and then there's time management but um, there's um, someone by the name of Brittany Berger um, has introduced the framework of energy management. So every time you, from when, from the moment you open your eyes at the end, at the beginning of each day until the time that you go to bed uh, every night, every activity um, costs a certain amount of energy. And that, uh, in so, some people refer to those as you know spoons. So you, so for example, if you have a ten or fifteen spoon day, then uh, that's the amount of energy that you have um, that day. But some days you may only have three or four spoons, and so um, arriving at you know the internship process um, in the framework of energy management. Um, I think is useful. Um, what I about you know what was it three four or five months ago when it was still negative twenty out here. Um, I uh, mentioned that um, from the um, uh, supervisors um, thing uh, that. Um, it'd be nice to have a plan B every day. Uh, so for example, if you are, um, if today's task is to do such and such, but, um, the, uh, but someone, uh, um, it may not have enough energy to get that thing done. Um, it happens, um, 
then maybe uh, move towards a plan B that um, acknowledges uh, that day's energies. Um, as for me, uh, speaking personally, what every time I have a very, very, very super duper productive day, that almost inevitably is followed by a crash day. Um, and so um, that's how I, so basically my, my weeks are, you know, Mondays and Tuesdays are kind of, you know, if Mondays are my, if Monday is my super duper productive day, then Tuesday is my crash day. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday gets kind of ironed out. Um, and then of course, if Monday is a crash day, uh, then Tuesday would, could be very productive. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday sort of irons those out. So um, when you see someone who is having a very, very, very super duper productive day, celebrate it, but maybe plan in your head a potential plan B, just in the back of your mind. Um, so plan B could be, um, like I said before, um, one of the uh, deliverables of an internship may be the presentation of a conference, um, which inevitably inevitably means um, um, uh, preparing an abstract. Uh, so that's one idea for Plan B. And I just um, the thought just crossed my mind right here is um, another way that I have set up my work is that I use Dropbox extensively. And so I have Dropbox on my computer at my office, which I lovingly call the dungeon. And then um, and then also here in my in my um, in my uh, room. Uh, and I have file and I have access to all my files um, in every which way. And then I even have Dropbox on my phone. So you know, if I go out on field excursions to, you know, out in the middle of the taiga forest and there happens to be a cell tower nearby, well, I at least have access to my files on my phone. So um, this offers the opportunity to do some work here. Like, for example, if I don't have the energy to maybe walk to campus, um, or, or in back, I can do some work here. Um, and then I can, you know, do some work here in the morning and then in the afternoon go into the office. And so that is how I, you know, it allows me to get some work done in the morning, uh, even though I, I, I think, you know, even though I'm the kind of person that thinks mornings should be banned. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, let's see. Um, but yeah, and I'll, another thing is um, that I'd like to um, 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 amplify a, a, a thing that um, Akila would, uh, was saying is the, the issue of trust. Um, I am now 38 years old, um, and I still remember uh, my time as a, um, a daycare uh, person. Um, I can recall my daycare days vividly for not good reasons. Um, and I was, you know, let's just say I was uh, experienced the B word, bullied. And so, um, you know, being teased not just by, um, by um, fellow daycare students, but also uh, the people that were supposedly employed to protect and defend uh, me against such stuff. So um, ever since then, I've had, you know, questions of, you know, of, you know, I've had issues with um, the issues of trust. And so uh, for many people, on the on the autism spectrum, um, as well as you know, neurodiverse cousins, um, um, the issue of trust needs to be earned, um, and um, 
and so that's another thing. Um, and so uh, another thing that I'd like to let's see touch upon. I wrote down these very uh, bizarrely looking notes, and I'm trying to think so. Ah, presentation planning and meetings. Um, uh, Siva, you mentioned um, uh, uh, alternative meeting, um, um, uh, ways of doing alternative meetings. Um, and you mentioned uh, that many of your students like gaming. Um, I'm wondering, so this hark harkens back to my time when I was living in South Africa, uh, when the world shut down and um, um, air travel prohib basically caused me to stay in, in South Africa due to a virus. And so I had to figure out uh, ways to, you know, use my time. And one uh, way I, that I used my time was Minecraft. Uh, there was a server called um, uh, Autcraft, which uses uh, the Minecraft interface. And so perhaps um, in maybe, you know, once every so often uh, having a meeting on Minecraft might be uh, a, a, a interest, an interesting way to to um, do this. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, um, let's see, trust. And so um, obviously I, I, I had in my notes uh, to mention the uh, Rainmaker et al paper, but that has already been taken care of. Um, and also, um, yeah, so I guess another sort of standard thing is um, matching skills, matching duties with skills and also preparing uh, students for just in time uh, skills, a, a skill set in the just in time. So, um, so for a, a lot, of, I'm guessing a lot of you are are in uh, meteorology or climatology or atmospheric scientists science, and so uh, maybe when you think about duties and skills, um, think about what would be useful five or 10, you know, three to five or 10 years down the line, um, you know, emerging technologies, because if you learn those technologies early, uh, they can be easy, they can be more employable later on. So that's, that, that's, um, I don't know how much time I have left, but, um, uh, if there's any opportunities for questions, I'd be happy to have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, excellent. And, and I wanted to just, you know, piggyback on on something you mentioned, Cole, about um, presentations. I know that one of the things I think I I learned um, last year with my with one of my students who had um, uh, ADHD and, and anxiety was that the typical thing in a program is you're doing your research and then you say, okay, this last week we're going to all work on a posters. And get those ready, and that ended up being that time frame of saying, okay, now we're actually going to, you know, we had a uh, the first week we talked about how you make a poster, but we didn't actually direct program activities to helping the students make the poster until that last three day period before we printed them out. And right. I think that that the lesson I really learned there was that you know that process of making, you know, for some students that process of making a poster needs to start well in advance because trying in a short amount of time to take all the disparate parts of their research and try to synthesize it into a final message was really difficult for my for my students yeah uh, so uh, there's uh, you, you, yeah so there are, are generally two types of presentations there's poster and then there's oral um and i've i've made um and i i remember my first time uh uh printing a poster and, and, and doing a poster. And um, let's just say it was, a, it was a lot bigger than I had planned because it was A0. Um, and um, it, and just, it was a really, it, it takes a while. So what I like to, what I've done in post, I'm, a, I'm better at speaking than, than creating 
posters, but nonetheless, one of the things that I've learned in terms of posters is um, be the tortoise and not the hare. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like to, I, you know, it, 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 if the goal is to present, present a poster, maybe start a few weeks, um, a few weeks, a couple, two or three weeks ahead of time. And um, just, you know, a little each day over a lot of days um, can really add up and be a good multiplier. Um, from also from a, 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 a presentation, a oral presentation perspective, um, I typically focus on one or two slides a day and I make them and I make them really detailed. And then I leave the last two days. Um, I, I leave the last two or three days uh, to write the script. Mm. And uh, I do scripting. So every page corresponds with a single slide. And I make and I make the font like 24 point uh, spaced three uh, spaced three times. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that um, that workflow has really helped me. And I also make a point at um, ending all uh, uh, oral presentation preparation 24 hours prior to the actual presentation. So I, um, so that's that just allows me time to sleep on what I'm going to be saying, and then um, and then making the presentation. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I think you know, one of the things we have, the reason why we had this as being an hour and a half is we wanted to have, you know, time for the presentations and lots of uh, questions that, that people, you know, participating um, might have. So please feel free to uh, add in questions into the chat. I'll just and ask questions of our, of our uh, guests here. That would be excellent as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm still, uh, yeah. So there, there was a question regarding, um, trauma, uh, and, and, and how I was bullied, uh, and, 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 and the consequences. Um, yeah, uh, uh, and my, I guess it, bullying is very, very, very difficult, um, to, to, to really, um, to really experience. Um, what helped me recover um, is one time. Uh, time is one method because uh, time does sort of um, sand the rough edges. Uh, but also one thing to help with is connecting with um, other, you know, people and, um, and connecting with people who are a part of, you know, who share similar um, experiences and really um, in um, really um, Connect with people that that you know are are, are friends um, to, to to and also with people who who are are of like mind. Um, those are help. Those are those are also very helpful. But another thing is time and and having different experiences. Um, and I, I was I, I so was looking forward to no longer being a daycare person, a daycare student. Yeah, that was liberating. Thank you for being able to share that with us, Paul. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I guess we want to, you know, again, kind of be conscious of, of time here. Um, again, if anyone uh, within the uh, group has any questions, 
Um, we'd certainly like our, our guests to be able to, uh, to answer them. We'll leave them a couple minutes with some closing thoughts too, if they want. Also, I'm gonna go ahead, uh, Val has shared her um, email address earlier. I'm gonna go ahead and, and share mine. We are looking for um, opportunities to provide resources for um, those leading internships. And so uh, we're finding lots of great suggestions from people. And so um, if you have any resources that you think would be a benefit or maybe some stories about things that, that were helpful for you, um, you know, please, please be willing to or be, you know, please email us um, and we can try to put those resources together because um, I don't know about some of uh, the rest of you who are running programs, but I know mine starts in, uh, in 20 days. <laughs> so I'm certainly trying to get everything ready. Uh, Val, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I wondered if um, any of you um, have suggestions about when <clears throat> when you're running a Zoom or you know Google Meet um, workshop, for example, or class, and um, you know I, I'm guessing that for some people going into breakout groups, you know those with anxiety and and some of the other kinds of examples that we've heard about um, is not is not a pleasant experience and um, you know people need to be warned about it that kind of thing but I'm just wondering if people have ideas about how to do that um, to help be inclusive and not force people into uncomfortable situations um, one idea being having a, a, a group that is a non-participating group like camera off and mic off So um, Val, I saw your question in the chat and I was going to come to that. Um, the idea of the quiet Zoom room, um, that's helpful. Um, I, in my in-person classes, often tell students that um, here's a group interaction that we're going to, or an activity that we're going to do in groups. But if you choose not to work with someone else and you want to do it on your own, feel free to do so. And then at the end, we'll all come together and share out responses or feedback. Um, and I encourage uh, the same thing in Zoom rooms or, you know, virtual meetings as well. Like if you don't want to join a, a room, um, you can work on it on your own and um, you can come back and, and share. Um, I also allow the flexibility to, I know a lot of my colleagues do not prefer when the, when the webcams are turned off and they want all the students and mentees faces all the time up there. That's very challenging, um, even for me. Um, and so I don't, you know, I use that flexibility as well. Um, also responding um, to one thing that I, that I wanted to share in some of the, like the methods to assess slide at the very end was um, thinking about creative ways to do the final presentations or posters or research papers, things like that if it can be a blog article or can it be um, a recorded podcast episode where the mentor and the mentee can have an interaction about what they learned or the findings of the project or something like that. It can be like a short five minute YouTube video. Um, that could be what is disseminated. So, so science dissemination, I know, you know, we have traditionally used conference presentations and posters and manuscripts and papers but um, we can think about other ways to do it. Um, I've had students create, like some of my um, students like graphic design, even though their major is not on designing, like web-based designing and stuff like that. They love designing flyers and things like that. So if there is a way to like represent your, your project findings in a visual poster, as opposed to a poster that's based on words, that's one way to evaluate outcome. Um, and like I was saying, you know, any other technology-based modalities like like vlogging, blogging, um, videos, things like that. Um, but but answering your YouTube, your Zoom question, um, yeah, allowing that flexibility is is helpful. Excellent. Any final questions from anyone in the, the group here?
All right, uh, it's 2.28. Uh, do our, any of our speakers have any final comments they'd like to make? Um, first of all, I, I would like to thank you all for um, the, 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 this, this presentation. Um, I, um, I, I'm, I'm glad to have participated um, and um, I look forward to further ways to participate. Um, and also, um, yeah, with respect to um, uh, you met, um, Siva mentioned uh, something about breakout rooms. I see you, or Valerie, I know it's one thirty, and my brain is about ready to go kaput. <laughs> but um, um, and talked about virtual breakout rooms, uh, 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 quiet rooms. Um, that's good, um, and it would be also good to uh, set aside um, or find a, a, a an actual room uh it, it some place to um on campus or or to to just also serve as something like that um i i just i remember i recall my times as a phd student at carleton university um and i re, i recall um you know spending a lot of my energy uh in, in during the daytime uh uh doing my work uh in a very high definition manner uh very detailed thinking but then when four or five p.m came around um and i was you know out of spoons um i regularly went to uh the centers for students with disabilities and i which was a club if you will run by the student um uh, student government uh, they had a room there and I just sat down on a recliner with a blanket and slept and I did that pretty much three or four times a week and that's what got me through hmm. yeah that's a great idea thank you all right if if there are no more further comments, uh, we want to thank everyone for um, thank our guests, uh, Shiva and Cole and Akila for presenting today. Uh, we want to thank all of you who took the time out of your day to educate yourself and learn more about this important topic, so we can make our summer experiences great for our for our students. And uh, again, uh, we've given email addresses. If you have any further questions, you prefer to uh, to ask offline. And so uh, we look forward to maybe meeting again in the future, Val, uh, and, and others to uh, kind of continue this conversation. Because I think as we go through and learn more, we're gonna have more and more questions and uh, more opportunities and needs to, to have talks like this. So thank you so much, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your day. I will. Thanks. Yeah.